small correction, John, John David Dalton. Uh, that's my name. Um, uh, this talk is going to be on unorthodox performance. Um, and before I get started, I kind of want to cover some of the perf principles. And these are the things that I'll be reinforcing throughout my talk. Uh, the first one is you optimize for correctness. Um, so it turns out doing things correctly doesn't necessarily align with doing things fast or doing things performant. Um, and so what you, you have to get creative to uh, do things correctly and not incur a cost. And so you'll see optimizations like this applied for things like uh, ES5 or ES6 shims. Uh, you want to make sure that you have this functionality, but without the crippling performance of following the spec to a T. Uh, so that's where you would do some performance optimizations. Uh, context. Context is important, too. Uh, a lot of times we talk about uh, don't micro-optimize. Uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. Um, but it's context. So for example, if you were creating a game and you had a render loop, very tight render loop, 16 milliseconds, some of the things that we would normally consider a micro-optimization could be very important to you, right? So it's always about anchoring your, your optimization or your performance work with the context of, of the use case. So for example, I may not want to optimize a function that's only called on the application initialization, uh, especially if it's only ca uh, called like once or twice. Um, the next one is optimize for the common case. Um, I'll, I'll actually dedicate a whole series of slides to this later on. But um, when you're developing API for your application, you tend to get a feel for what the common use case is for this, this a, uh, specific piece of API. Um, and you may have to support a lot of edge cases, right? You may have browser issues or compat issues if you're client side. Uh, you may have to support various versions of Node if you're server side. Um, or just you may have to support, like, what if they pass a string to this function instead of a number? But all of those edge cases shouldn't um, detract from your, your primary use case. Uh, if it does, then you should go back and, and do perf work to make sure that your primary use case is optimized. So that's optimized for the common case. Uh, the next one is the counteract the costs. So uh, when I was first creating Lodash, like before it was even Lodash, there was a pull request to underscore to um, improve IE8 support in object iteration um, and array iteration. Uh, and one of the main things uh, that, that would roadblock that pull request was performance. They wanted to make sure that um, all of these fixes didn't have a, a cost associated with it. And so I started to have to, to kind of rework some of those. So that's counteracting costs. Uh, the first bit here is going to be over, um, uh, this is a few of my favorite things that I'll cover that I've learned since the last time I've done this talk, which was for Lodash 3.0. Lodash 4.0 is coming out in January-ish. Um, and so this is kind of a revision of some of the perf work that I've learned while working on, on Lodash. So the first one is, um, before I get to that, follow along. If you uh, have internet connection and it's working, you can go to github.com, Lodash slash Lodash, tree, whatever, npm. Uh, Lodash is a monolithic library uh, by default, but it's modular if you use like the npm package. Um, and so that's just pulling up the npm branch of uh, the Lodash repository and all the code samples I'll be going through. Uh, surprise, if you're not into code samples, this talk may not be for you. Uh, usually I do a lot of hand wavy stuff. Today it's going to be just digging into the actual code uh, to examine the perf work. Um, so follow along there. That's github.com Lodash slash Lodash and then the, the NPM branch. Cool. All right. So the first thing I'm going to look at is the common case. Uh, this is again optimizing for um, a, a, a normal use case, or your, your most common use case. So let's look at um, base is match. So this is, at that, at that branch, there's a folder called internal, and there's a JavaScript file called base is match. Cool. All right, so let's look at base is match. And so I'm just going to zoom in on the source code here, um, because it's a little beefy. But here we go. I'll zoom in a little bit more just to cover the first half. So the main thing here is uh, base is match. Is match is a function that says um, you have a source object and you have a vanilla object, a user provided object, and you want to see if the the user provided object matches the source. So like say if you're wanting to conform an object to a specific layout uh, or a, a specific property structure. Um, the, the naive approach is to iterate all the properties in your object, your user given object, uh, and check for deep equality, right? So that means you're going to 
do a has own property check if you're checking for own properties. You're going to do a deep property crawl. Uh, you're going to go to the next property, do a has own property check. You're going to do a deep property crawl all the way through, right? And, and then if one of those fails, then you return false because it, it does not match, right? But that means you're doing a lot of work up front for a possible fail case. And the common case for is match is that it, it does not match. Um, you, so one of the properties along the way will probably f result in false. And so you don't want to do deep, uh, deep object crawling for all that work just to throw it away as false. Um, and so in this case, what I'm doing uh, here on line 27 and 35, down to 35, is doing a first pass. So breaking that, that, that one while loop or that one iteration into two, two uh, uh, iterations of the object. One, doing a light pass over it. In this case, depending on if you pass a customizer function, which kind of gets off topic, uh, it does a strict equality check, which is super cheap, right? Triple equals, boom. If it doesn't match, it falls out. Uh, or it does a in property check. So it's either doing like, um, does, the vo does the value actually exist in the object? And if it does, great, move on to the next one. But this way, if at any point in time during that first uh, iteration, it doesn't match, you haven't done your deep object crawl yet, right? So it's super fast. It gets out for the common case of missing, of missing the, the deep object crawl. And then later on in this next bit, let me see if I can zoom in and then move down um, here. All right. Here it's doing the heavier base is equal right here. Um, and that's the beefier check. Don't worry about the, pro the, pro or the params on the other side of it. The main thing is, is the second loop here is now doing the heavier check. So uh, I have a function called base is match, which is abstracted away from the is match method. Uh, internally, I'm able to pass it things like, and this kind of bleeds into my next slide, so that's why I'm covering it. Um, here you can see I've got match data as a parameter. So one of the methods that you can also do is, is a matches function, which you pass it a source object, it creates a function that then compares whatever object it's passed to to the source object. So instead of doing is match and passing both the source and the user provided object, you can then just create a function that accepts the user provided object and compares it to the original source. Um, and in that case, I crawl the source object first uh, and then do, uh, determine if I can do deep equality comparison. And so what can you do deep equality, com or, or sorry, strict equality, uh, strict equality comparison? And so by that, I mean tr uh, st uh, strict equals, like triple equals. Um, and so that's for anything that's primitive. Uh, I don't count NAN in this case, because NAN does not equal triple equal NAN. Um, but anything else, it lets me know I can do the fast path. And so I store that metadata up front uh, and then on subsequent executions of the matches function, I don't have to do all that checking up front. I can just know, all right, fast path these properties, and then I can exit out. So that's another way of optimizing. And this is studying the common case. Most of the time when you're looking for a needle in a haystack, you're not gonna find the needle. And so that's where optimizing for the common case here comes into play. Cool. Now, let's move on. So abstraction. Um, and then for abstraction, I'm going to look at uh, the for each implementation, which then breaks down into array each and create base each. So when I first started Lodash, I thought abstraction was, was bad. I thought breaking your code into smaller pieces um, uh, creates performance issues because you have more functions to execute, right? So that's slower. Ah, but engines are smart and they have JIT compilers which can detect hot code paths and then inline those functions into uh, the jitted form of the, of the, the code, uh, which means that those functions, even though they're separate functions, end up melting away. So there isn't a cost for that, that function invocation. And what it does is uh, these JIT engines, or these, these JavaScript engines, when they JIT uh, and they inline, inlining favors small functions um, because when you inline, you're not just injecting that code into the parent function. Uh, you have to account for uh, all of the side effects as well. And that has overhead associated with it. Um, and so it's not just as easy as copy chunk of code out, paste it into the parent. Um, but uh, it does allow you to, to, to iterate your code faster. And what's also cool is, um, these methods can then be 
inlined differently. So for example, um, if your code path hits the objects a lot, it will inline the object base, so in this case base each. Uh, but if you pass arrays, it will inline the array function. So it will create, the JIT will create two flavors, two JITed forms of your function. One for the object iteration, one for the array iteration. Uh, it gets a little tricky if you start going back and forth. Some engines don't handle that well. Um, and what it will do is it will bail out, go back to your slow path, re-JIT, and go back up. Um, but anyways, uh, inlining also allows you to inline not only into your parent function, but if, if it still qualifies, inline into the, that, that function's calling function as well. So you can do multiple layers of inlining. So small functions are great. Uh, it also allows you to improve your readability um, and uh, searchability of the source. Um, when I first started Lodash, I, had a, I, I leveraged its template function, which is used for like HTML. Uh, but instead of doing HTML, I used it to generate JavaScript functions. So it was creating the function and then unrolling the for loop. Uh, super, what I thought at the time, super great for performance. It was horrible for readability. Like no one, no one contributed to Lodash during that period because it was just a scary looking chunk of code. So by removing that, using uh, modules, using smaller functions, you'll, you'll end up uh, getting better contributions to your source code. So let's look at an example of uh, for each. All right, so here's for each. Um, and as you can see, uh, let's see here, I'll zoom in. Bloop. I'm requiring in array each, base each, is array into function. Um, and I'll go down past the documentation. Um, and you can see this, this for each function is doing a couple of checks up front. I don't, can you all see that? Do, should I zoom in more? Yay, nay, all right. I'll zoom in just a little bit more. Cool. Um, so what it's doing is I'm optimizing for the common case. When you use for each, you're probably not passing it an object. You're probably not passing it a string. You're probably passing it an array. Uh, and um, you're probably passing it a function. Um, our, our Lodash's methods can support callback shorthands, which means like if you have a map, instead of passing it a function that returns the, the value, like the element of the array dot the property name, you can just pass it a string of the property name and it'll create the function for you. But that's all overhead, right? And that's all not the common case. So in this case, I check to see if the iterate t is a function, and if it is, also if there's an array, and then I go to the common case, which is the array each, which is super fast. It's essentially a for loop, which I'll show you in a second. Um, and what's nice about that is because it is a for loop, um, uh, the, the actual iterate t, the function that you pass, uh, if it qualifies, can then be inlined uh, into uh, that, that function, or at least that, that array each can be inlined into the parent. Different JIT heuristics do different things. So for example, Chakra, the, the JavaScript engine that's in Microsoft Edge, if there's a for loop, it won't inline the function call. But the actual function, like the array each, could be inlined into for each. So there's still inlining opportunities there. Uh, and then else, do the base each. The base each is what handles object iterations, strings, basically anything that's not array. Cool. All right, so here's the array each. And I'll zoom in. So you can see, super simple, right? It's doing an array. Um, it's uh, just executing the iterate t, passing it three arguments, doing a falsy check. R for each allows you to exit the iteration early, like a break statement in a for loop. You can use that with uh, for each or the alias each. Um, in previous versions of this, I showed how you could hoist out the this binding. Uh, so in, in Lodash 3, you can pass this third argument over here called this arg. Like uh, ES5 supports it too, but almost no one ever passes that this arg, right? So why are you binding your function every time for something that's almost never used? So normally I would check for that and then not do that and hoist that out. But in, in Lodash 4, I'm removing that parameter entirely because if you want your function to be bound, you can use the, the bind function or the underscore dot bind function. Um, so in this case, super simple uh, method here. Uh, next one is a little beefier. Here, so this is the base each function. It's, uh, you can see it's not as optimized. I'm allowing you to pass in your each, your each function, the thing that actually does uh, the iteration. So if for an object, it would pass in like a for own or a for in to iterate over own, own properties of an object or inherited properties of an object. Uh, and then it gives you the indicator of do you want to uh, iterate from the right or the left um, because 
our methods allow you to go for each right or for each, so going this way or that way, depending on your, your preference, uh, so you can do that. And here, it's doing things like ensuring that the iterable is an object, that when it's, so when it's passed to the callback, you always get the object. So it's doing a little bit more work here. It's actually having to get the keys uh, from the value and do, um, do more iteration. So more work, the an uncommon case abstracted away into its own function so it doesn't hinder your common case. Super cool. All right. All right, next up, bye-bye built-ins. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll just leave it. Bye-bye, right. all right. So, so how many people here before attending my talk assumed that JavaScript built-ins were faster than anything you could create on your own? I guess, all right, woo, like it's, it's the, 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 uh, it's your intuition. You think that if it's provided by the language, it should be faster. In JavaScript, that's not the case. Uh, in JavaScript, it's bizarro land, uh, and it turns out your own code that you write in like a for loop can be significantly faster than uh, the ES5 methods and some ES6 methods. Um, and that's because uh, these ES5 methods were standardized you know, a few years back, but before then, so almost 10 years now, they've been in environments across uh, browsers before they were actually standardized. And they've been slow that entire time. Like they've never, they've gone back and optimized a few methods here or there, but in large, they, they haven't gone back to do an optimization path uh, pass. They, the engine uh, devs uh, for various browsers uh, implemented them and then moved on to the next thing. And that's kind of what happens with ES6 and ES7. They implement these new methods, great, you have them, but they're not optimizing them as they go. And then it turns out there's always more work to do uh, and you never go back and optimize these things. So a lot of it, it's not because the engine can't do it. Uh, the engine could be just as fast as your vanilla alternatives. It's that there hasn't been a push uh, to do that. So uh, what, I, what I learned, uh, and this is kind of what spurred Lodash development in the first place, was I gave a talk a couple years ago uh, in 2012 about uh, the high cost of natives, which was showing alternatives to array uh, map for each filter, but written in, in JavaScript, and they perform significantly better. And that's because unlike some of these, these built-ins, uh, they can leverage things like uh, inlining of your functions. Uh, because it's just a for loop, the engines know how to handle for loops really well and uh, function invocation and inlining really well. Um, sometimes if it's a, a built-in function, it's written in C++ and there's some juggling that has to go between the JavaScript layer and the uh, C++ layer. So they may not be able to support inlining. Also, uh, common case, uh, you usually don't deal with sparse arrays, right? So by spec, it says you have to do like a property inspection of every index in the array to see like, does this index exist? Is it a whole? Should I skip it? it? Turns out if you just treat it as a dense array and go zero to length and iterate over it, it's super fast, right? Um, so that's another way to optimize your stuff uh, and it's just by avoiding some built-ins. Now I say some built-ins because um, it's hit and miss. It's not all built, all built-ins aren't slow. There's some really fast ones. Um, like uh, array is array. It, array is array you can't beat. Like if you try to do that on your own, you're gonna fail. There's no way to beat the native implementation. It's super fast. Uh, uh, the JSON implementations like uh, parse uh, string or whatever, uh, stringify, um, those are, are super fast. And you, you can't create alternatives to those that are faster. Um, but in this case for map, which I'll show you, uh, let's go here. This is just a simple implementation of map, all right? Uh, and you may see that on line number 13, I'm pre-allocating the array. Um, and that's actually a little tweak for uh, performance of uh, setting array values. You basically say, hey, I know this array is going to be this length, uh, so it pre-allocates that in memory, so it's, you're not having to grow the array as you add in values. And so since map, you know that map is going to be a sh uh, the same length as the input array, you can just pre-allocate that and then start pumping in values uh, into the map. Uh, and that is an example here of doing a, just a vanilla implementation. So I create Lodash so y'all don't have to worry about this stuff. If you use Lodash, you get, you get the, the good performance. I know when to drop down into the native, uh, the built-ins, and leverage them. Uh, but anyways, that's, that's some coolness there for map. I'm gonna show you some filter now too. So here's filter. If you're following along, this is just, look, it's just calling the predicate and incrementing the value there. Uh, don't worry about that plus plus index. Um, 
I go back and forth on that. It's a micro-optimization. I'm anti-micro-optimization. You shouldn't have to worry about it. I'm not touching it anymore. I've gone back and forth on it, whatever, it's in there. Don't do it, like, don't worry about it. Uh, micro-optimization is no good in this case. But anyways, you can see though that it's, it's just a simple for loop. It's, it's doing the filter, essentially what is in ES5, except it will be significantly faster. Um, so that's great. Okay. Cool. Um, now ES6. So I said, hey, uh, ES5 methods, some of them not so great in performance. ES6, haha. -ha. There's some methods that are really great for performance. Um, and they are, uh, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but whatever. Um, map, set, weak map. You can do a lot of cool things with them. So I'm going to step by step through map, set, and weak map in a code examples to show you how you can leverage them to get better performance. Um, they do have, like, they're, they're, they're tricky areas, but if you navigate to uh, a narrow subset of their functionality, you can get some really good perf wins. Um, other methods I want to shout out to on performance on the negative side are object.assign. Ooh, uh, that one. Um, I pushed for it to be fast in Chakra. So I was the perf PM before moving to the apps and frameworks team on Edge. Uh, for Chakra, which is the JavaScript engine in Edge. So I made sure that uh, our object assign was, was uh, fast and that some other methods were, were super speedy. Um, but that's not the case across all engines. And you don't program for one, I hope you're not programming for one environment. You should be programming for, for multiple, especially if you're your browser land. Don't do like best viewed in Chrome nonsense. Like test, like over here, sorry for the mini rant. Um, I have my IEs. I have my, my uh, Firefoxes and Safaris. I used to have a whole lot more. Um, like it would go back to Firefox 2 and Chrome 5 or 1, whichever was available on, on, on uh, OS X there. Um, but don't, I, I've switched to being modern first, which is just the current browser version in one back. Anyways, uh, end of rant. Um, so, <laughs> um, yeah, cool. Let's go look at some of these codes. So this is gonna be map. All right, map cache. So you may be wondering why not just use map straight up? If ES6 map is great, why not use it all the time? Um, it turns out map is great for objects, uh, but not for primitives. So boolean, null, string values, uh, numbers, uh, undefined. Those things you can use just a normal object lookup. You assign them as a property to that object, uh, then you like give it a value of true, and then say, hey, does, does the, the null key in this object exist? If yes, it's in the hash. Um, uh, new hash there, so if I zoom in just a little more, hey, new hash here, that's actually just another abstraction around using object.create null. So object.create null is an ES5 method um, where I'm passing it the null option for the, pro for the prototype value, which means that this object doesn't inherit from anything, which means there's no like prototypical walk uh, on the inheritance chain to see if a property exists, which means when you assign a value to it, its lookup is really fast, it's super cool. Uh, engines optimize for it, so like you're gonna get a speed boost, a big speed boost in Firefox. Uh, Safari loves it. Uh, Edge and, and Chrome dig it too. Uh, it's supported in all modern browsers, so do it. It's supported in, in uh, IE9 uh, and up. It's supported in all the, the, the Firefox's Edges or, or Chrome's and Safari's. Like, Anytime you're wanting to use, use a map and you're not reaching for map, like the ES6 map, object.create null. Great. Uh, so anyways, I'm doing that here for those cases of, um, of uh, um, looking them up. So instead of using the ES6 map, you can see here though, I am also doing a, a toggle for ES6 map. Um, and then if it doesn't exist, I'm falling back to an array. Uh, also, I create my own hash lookup for strings just because uh, you could pass a string value and the string value could be null or it could be undefined or Boolean, right? And so it would look like the key of one of the other values in that simple hash. And so strings get their own hash uh, to be isolated on their own. Um, but anyways, that creates this map cache uh, abstraction. And you can see it actually implements the API of ES6 map. 
So it's got delete. The reason I'm doing brackets here for delete is because some engines, and if I'm going modern first, I should probably remove it, but whatever. Uh, older engines used delete. It was a reserved word uh, for properties, and it would the, the parser would bork on that and just blow up. So you got to bracket it, whatever. You don't have to worry about it if you're modern first. Um, cool, so there's that. Now moving on to the next one is uh, map delete. So just kind of wanted to skim over some of these here. Um, what I'm doing is <clears throat> if a value is keyable, and that means if it's one of those primitive values where I don't have to do a deep lookup. So Boolean numbers are a big one. People who do micro benchmarks love to do an array of numbers and like, like that's gonna represent your data set. Uh, but whatever, uh, it, it's keyable and so I go the fast path for it. Um, and then you can, I, I juggle and do data there to, to decide which hash I want to do. Do I want to do the string hash or the hash, the hash hash? I could probably come up with better names. Um, or uh, fall back to the actual map delete function. Uh, you can see that if map doesn't exist, I've got an associative uh, delete function, which is just like, it's the old school map implementation. Uh, the reason I do this is I want to leverage native map. Because native map is awesome for object lookup. So if native map doesn't exist, I don't want to go down that code path. Um, and I do this by checking if a function is really built in. Um, and I, I don't have time to cover the source for it yet, but what you do is uh, you take a reference function. In my case, object.prototype.has property. Uh, you coerce it to a string. It generates, uh, turns out, a, by the way, if you uh, coerce a function to a string, you get its source generated for you. That's kind of a neat trick. Uh, if it's built in, it doesn't give the source code up uh, because that would be weird. Uh, what it does is it says native code. Oh, that's your indicator that it's a native function. Uh, but different environments represent that value slightly different. So what I do is I take that generated string, I strip out anything that can identify that function, so like say its name, uh, I convert that to a regular expression, I then coerce other functions to strings, and then compare to see if they, if they match that regular expression, and that tells me that that function is built in and not a shim, or not accidentally paved over by something. Cool, uh, and that gets me to that, that function there. <laughs> um, yeah, super neat. Cool, uh, git, same thing, it's keyable, basically like delete, let's see if there's anything interesting on this next one. Um, Paz, last check, same thing too, cool. I think that's it for map set being cool, everything else kind of repeat. But you can see I'm just implementing the same, the same uh, interface as map, but also doing the toggle for if it's keyable, if map exists, and if not, the fallback. Um, so that's it, uh, ba, 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 ba. that gets into my next one, so I'll zoom out. Zoom out, wee, and go back to my presentation. All right, so next up, set. Uh, the reason I did set second is because set can be implemented as a map. And in fact, in Lodash version four, I'm not doing that, that native check for map and set. Uh, I'm just using map. And under the hood, I'm making it look like a set. So a set is like a map where it can store unique values, right? But there's not a key value association, it's just values. Right, so what I do to simulate a set in Lodash is it is a map where the key is the object of the set and then the value is just true or something, whatever. It doesn't matter. The value will never be accessed. I'm only using the key. Uh, what's great is keys can be, are, are unique. So in a map, your key doesn't have to be a string. It can be an object, which is why I like to use them. Um, and so I'm implementing set by way of map. All right. So. Getting over there to it, set cache. All right, so here I create a map cache and then I'm doing something I'm pushing. Um, why am I pushing instead of having like an add function? It's because where I use this set cache, it's, it's covered a little bit later, uh, is to simulate an array, right? I want to, if you're doing unique or difference or intersection or the semantic difference of of arrays, uh, normally you have to do an index of crawl of the arrays to look for values, right? An index of is this linear search, right? So it goes from zero, uh, one, two, three, or four, all the way to the end. So say you have an array of like 100,000 elements, uh, and you're trying to diff the, find the difference between two of these arrays, right? That's a massive amount of crawling back and forth. 
back and forth. And it turns out you can optimize that away by uh, pushing all of those values into a set uh, because sets are automatically unique, which is great for uniquing arrays. Um, and lookups is constant. It's a constant time. So you don't have to worry about the lookup increasing the larger your array gets, right? So I have a heuristic in place, which I won't get into uh, the source code for, but it basically says, hey, if your array is larger than 200 elements, use the set cache. Uh, there is some overhead to creating that set cache because you have to then take all those elements, push them into the set. But after 200 elements, it doesn't really matter. It's a wash and you get this like fixed cost for array iteration. It's great uh, for these methods like difference uh, and, and uh, unique and uh, union. Um, how many people know what Gitter is? No one? Oh, got, so, got one. Yeah, Gitter? Gitter chat for GitHub repos? Yeah. So they recently switched from underscore to Lodash. Yay, woo! Um, but one of the reasons they did was because of performance of unique. And that's because underscore does this index of value and they're, they're uniquing uh, IDs for their entire, uh, for all of their rooms. Um, and so that means as there's more rooms, there's like 300,000 IDs to parse, it starts to slow down your node process, right? So they, they have this really cool graph. I won't show it now because it's just like, hey, look, our performance was really slow before, and now it's really good. Uh, so whatever. Um, when, they, when you switch to doing something like this with set, you can, you can improve your performance for things like a chat client or uh, other stuff. So cool. Neat. Next up we have... Um, let me zoom out so you can catch the name of this. Uh, this is the cache has. So I also do the has check for a value, and this is a similar thing where it's deferring to the map to check for the has. All right, cool. All right, let's see if there's anything interesting here for you. That's just the push implementation. I've kind of already gone over that. Uh, base unique, this is the cool bit. This is the unique function I was talking about. Um, and you can see here, I'm doing the heuristic for the large array up here. See that? Hey, hey, if you're a large array, use the set cache. If you're not, don't do that. Um, large array, in my case, was uh, an array of 200 elements. I did that by profiling all the browsers, figuring out a nice between ground for all of them where the perf of one wasn't grotesque compared to the other, and that's where I chose my heuristic. Um, it, sure, it'll evolve as browsers improve. It doesn't really matter. Uh, if you're doing 200 iterations, it's fast enough, right? Uh, this, main, this really benefits things for like hundreds of thousands of elements, or even just thousands and thousands of elements. Um, but you can see uh, over here, uh, I'm doing just the, the normal like index of uh, thing, like the, I'm using includes here. But depending on if it's Depending on if it is uh, a fast path or not, that includes could be um, just doing an index of and returning true or false if the value exists, or it could be using the set cache. So that's all you have to do is toggle on those functions there, um, and it's seamless. I'm not having to fork my code tons to support this. So when you're designing your functions, try to think of APIs that you can um, masquerade your optimizations as and then just pipe them in. So that's what I was doing here was if it was fast enough, my includes is just cache has, right? Because includes and has both return Boolean values. So great, cool. I think the next one's gonna be into weak maps. So I would normally go to a slide that said, hey, weak maps, but whatever, we're in it. Um, Weak maps, I'm doing this check just for weak map to see if it is a native function, and that's doing that coercion thing again. Uh, because weak maps cannot be shimmed. Uh, never use a weak map shim. Ah, I won't say never, but whatever. Um, just be aware that the advantage of weak maps is that if your object is no longer used, if it's been garbage, first it allows your object to be garbage collected. And if it is garbage collected, the key uh, and the value are removed from the map automatically. So you don't have this thing like zombie DOM elements that are memory leaking your page, right? When the element is removed, it cleans up for you. Great. Uh, and I use uh, weak maps to store metadata on functions um, to avoid wrapping functions. Uh, again, so rewrapping. So uh, Lodash provides functions for uh, bind, partial, curry, curry write, already rearranging the arguments of the function, um, bleh, wrap, a few other ones. Uh, and they all wrap the function. And if you apply them uh, 
to all to one function, normally you would be creating a wrapper around a wrapper around a wrapper around a wrapper. It gets who you it gets you what you want in the end, but you're going through like five or six other function calls that are doing apply and disabling optimizations along the way just to get to your function. Um, and so what metadata allows me to do is I, I associate uh, a key of the weak map with the function. So the function is the key. Um, I then add to it all of the attributes of currying, of binding, of partial application, of the argument order, of all of those things into an entry, uh, like an array, of the weak map. And so I know that, hey, this function has associated with it all these attributes. Um, and then when I create a wrapped function for that, I know that I can just create one wrapper around the original function. So it's not three functions or four functions or six functions deep. It's just one function wrapped around your original, which gives you a lot better performance. Um, and this comes in handy for things like functional programming, where you want your methods to be auto-curried and you want the argument order to be flipped, where it's data last, iterate first. Uh, you can do that with a little to no cost uh, with Lodash because of that metadata. So, cool. Are you all cool with there being this much source? Like, all right, because it's just, usually it's hand wavy and I just decided to go into it today, so, cool. <clears throat> Great, uh, I'm about to get into the metadata stuff and that gets pretty heavy. I use bit masks uh, uh, because I wanted to use bit masks. <laughs> I, I got an excuse to use them and I was just like, yes. Uh, I believe this is it, so this is it. This is the big, the big beastie function. Um, cool, here I go. This is create wrapper. <clears throat> it's uh, just to be like, if I, oh, I don't have the, oh, here's the doc block for it right here. It says, hey, this is, I have to reference this doc block like every time, so bit masks are great because you can cram a lot of values into a single parameter, but you, you, there's no way to remember all those values, right? I gotta use a map every time, or a, a documentation. But it's great because for y'all, you don't have to worry about it. I don't have to have a function with 18 arguments, uh, and I get the benefit of storing it in one value. Um, anyways, so like my bit mask here says, hey, the first, if it's a value of one, it's bound. A, if it's two, it's key bound. Then there's curry, curry right, partial, partial right, re-arg, like Ari, um, and there may be a few others. I also have, uh, I also store things for, I'll just zoom in a little bit more if you need it here, see all that stuff. That's just a key for the bit mask. I also store things like partial uh, placeholders. And uh, let me just check my time real quick. Hey, all right, that's cool. Uh, I'm doing good. So I also store things like uh, placeholders for partial application. Um, uh, and other data associated with the function, like the this binding too here. Um, so what all of this does, and it does look a little, a little scary, um, but it's my one function that is like this. So I'm able to abstract it away into a single function that has documentation on it that controls the wrapping and metadata for like all, all the other functions that, that, that do transform. So it's like 10 or 15 functions, right? Uh, abstracted all the ugliness away into one module. Um, but what it allows me to do is is I can check to see if, for example, if I'm in, in this, first in, uh, this first block here, right here, and, and over here, if, a, if I'm not doing a partial uh, application right or left, then I shouldn't have any partial values uh, to be tracked. So I just clear them out automatically. Uh, this is a, a safeguard for me when I was implementing things to make sure that I didn't accidentally pass values and track values that I didn't need to track. Um, so if everything's right, I shouldn't need that. I should be able to clean that out, but I'm a little hesitant to remove it. Um, and then down here, see, this is the actual metadata. This new data, this array, this is all the metadata that I'm tracking uh, right there. And it ends right there. If you can see at the very end, look, there's the semicolon. Um, it ends right there. Uh, and that's it. Um, and then I merge the data, and merging is its own thing I'll get into. And then at the bottom, let's see if I can zoom in a little, a little more. Nope. I'll zoom in down here. At the bottom, I create the wrapper. That's all you need to know here. I'm creating a wrapper. I'm creating what's called a hybrid wrapper. Basically, hey, if you're only creating a bound function, um, you don't need to worry about partial application. You don't need to worry about currying. You're just binding the this, the this value to that function executing function. Um, so I have a special wrapper that fast paths creating bound functions because it turns out that you use bind a lot. Right, that's a, that's a go-to function. You wanna make sure that's speedy. And it turns out V8's bind is really, 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 really slow. 
really slow. It's the worst out of all the engines. Uh, Edge lucked out and got the fastest, one of the fastest implementations, but they didn't, it just fell out like of their implementation. I can't take credit for like making that fast. Um, but anyways, I also have a fast path for partial application too, and then everything else goes into hybrid. That means, hey, if you're curry plus partial plus uh, uh, rearranging your arguments, you all go to the slow path. And that's, again, thinking of your common case, forking for the common case, a bind, a partial, and then everyone else gets the slow case. So you can see the, the principles are going in there. Um, and then at the very bottom, I have set base data or, uh, or set data. Um, and that has to deal with a bug with weak maps that I'll get into. Uh, or will I? I will. Um, cool. Uh, get data. Get data, super simple. Hey, I, I, uh, I have a weak map, I call it meta map, uh, and then I use it to get the data associated with the function. That's just normal ES6 uh, syntax for your map. Um, so nothing too scary there, see? Metadata, not scary, super cool. Um, the next one, all right, so this is kind of where it gets gross. Uh, so, weak maps, they're great, but it turns out if you're hitting a weak map over and over and over again with values, um, it can cause massive GC pauses in V8 and in possibly other environments. I think <laughs> Firefox is doing all right now, but there's still an issue with V8. And what is what do most people use when they're debugging uh, or writing Node apps? It's it's V8. Um, so I didn't want my primary use case to be slow when people are benchmarking one function versus the other or using it for their Node app. Um, so what I have to do is I detect if this is gross, don't do this, don't do this. I put in my own like JIT heuristic for if a function is hot. And so if, if, if so I have a, a hot count here, hey, 150, and then a span. So if it's called 150 times within the time period of 16 milliseconds, then I don't use this optimization. I short circuit out of it. And I say map doesn't exist, use the fallback because I have all those fallback uh, pieces, uh, uh, things, which allows it to still not cause massive GC pauses and gives you temporarily slower functions that could be wrapped um, if you are wrapping. Um, but that's what I have to do. It's super gross. No one should ever have to do that. But the code is pretty simple. And again, I abstracted away. This is set data. Set data uh, has the shortcut, uh, the short, the short out logic in there. You can see here where I'm doing that. Uh, and then base set data is just setting the data. So uh, when I was juggling before, I said, hey, if data has never been written to before, it's not, this is the first time, right? So the, the heuristic doesn't matter um, because it's the first time it's being executed. I can always set metadata there. It's only on repeat ones where I have to worry about it. And that's the weak map issue. So yes, weak maps are great. Just if you're running them in a benchmark which executes a million times a second, ooh, watch out for it. Um, there you go, cool. Ah, I think that's almost it for, for metadata, y'all. Oh, nope, merging the data. So I do some other cool things here um, uh, with doing fast paths for merging data. Um, so I, I could allow a wide array of uh, a variety of composition of functions. So like a partial function that's also curried, that's also bound, that has its argument flipped, I could store metadata on that, right? But eventually the order in which you apply those becomes important. And that's where metadata falls, uh, it, the, my implementation of metadata falls on its face because it's just an array of things to apply to that function. There's no concept of order, right? So as soon as order becomes a significant part of uh, the metadata, I don't use the metadata, and I, I punt on the binding or the merging of the metadata and say, hey, I can't do this, give me a new wrapper for the function. Um, and that's what these, these kind of scary looking checks here, here. I say, hey, is this a combo that I support? And it turns out I support a case for functional programming where you're going to curry your function, you're going to set the already of your function, uh, and you're going to swap the order of the arguments of that function to be data first, uh, or sorry, iterate T or predicate first, data last. Um, and so that's what this is combo is for or is common case. And if it's if it's not those, I exit out without merging the data, which will then create a new wrapper for that function. Or I go through, zoop, I go through, let's see, here we go. I go through and merge that data uh, there, which means like, hey, if I was partially applying it first, like partially applying a function means that you 
you give it some of the arguments it needs to execute, but not all of them. And it will create a new function that then accepts the remainder of the arguments uh, to, uh, to execute on. Um, and so when you're merging that data, I have, uh, I merge the partial, the previous partial with the new partial, which then creates the next bit of, of partialed arguments. It combines them to get, uh, together, and that's just merging uh, your metadata. I also do things where I, I support placeholders, which is another level of complexity which you don't have to worry about. But on top of partially applying a function, I allow you to skip an argument and go to the next one. So you'll, leave, you'll let the argument fall through at a spot, and that's called a placeholder. So you're, al you're allowed to have holes in your partial application. Um, and I track all that. And that's this merge data function. It's abstracted away again into a single function that if you don't want to worry about it, you never have to see it. It just does its job. Uh, super neat. Um, great. All right. I'm going to hold off and go back. Almost there. And back. Cool. So I looked at those. I looked at all that. Now lazy evaluation. Um, so in Lodash 3.0, I added something called lazy evaluation, which means, <clears throat> one second. How many people are familiar with Lodash's chaining syntax? Cool. In version three, I made that chaining syntax uh, lazy or deferred, which means that when you uh, write the syntax for it, it doesn't actually execute until you call an implicit or explicit dot value on the function. And what that allows you to do is create sequences of actions to apply to a value that are executed on demand. And it also allows me to inspect the sequence of actions and optimize the iteration of those actions. And so here is like a rough uh, proximity of lazy evaluation. On the left, you have the old way, which is to, uh, in this case, it's doing a filter, doing the entire filter over all the elements, and then taking three elements after that. And then in the optimized form of it, the filter is collapsed into the take, and so that it only takes the first three elements that pass the filter. So you don't have to continue on applying your filter to the rest of the collection. So it cuts out that iteration. Um, and in another way of looking at it is this. Hey. I've got an array of 100K elements. Uh, I'm going to do a map, which is going to square those values. Then I'm going to get uh, the even values there. And then I'm going to slice and just take the four that pass that, right? Uh, this pattern happens quite a bit. Um, uh, it's varying degrees of complexity there. But anyways, what this would have to do then is how many iterations is that? It's, it's like, like 200 iterations, because it's doing all of the map, all of the filter, and then slicing off four elements. 200 iterations. Here's the Lodash syntax. Uh, by the way, this syntax was very similar to the previous syntax in version 2, uh, where shortcut fusion wasn't supported. So you didn't have to change your syntax, and you got this optimization. So, so here, chaining syntax. It looks kind of like the native one, right? Uh, map, filter, take, for. I could also do slice 0, but I wanted to show the pretty API. Um, and then I call a value, right? So how many iterations is it? It's eight iterations. So 200,000 iterations or eight iterations. It's super fast. It's great. Um, that's, short, that's, that's lazy evaluation and shortcut fusion. Um, so let's, here's the gist of it, too. Another, like a super simplified version of it. Hey, I've got the square function from the map, remember? Um, I call it, and then I do like the, the is, is it even? If it is, then I push that value to the result. Um, and you can write your code like this, but it's not pretty. It, it, it's kind of, it's gross. It, it's inflated, it's, it's not as, it doesn't read as well for you. And so you can use the chaining syntax, get the readability, and also get the performance without having to do anything to your code. It just shakes out. Uh, there's heuristics in place which know that, hey, it's got to be, uh, the, uh, the segment has to be operated on, by, uh, on an array, because I only support shortcut fusion on array. I could go all out and support it on objects too, uh, and other values. But that's more code, right? And what's the common case? The common case is array iteration. So I, I focus it down to not adding a ton of code to Lodash, but I can still support this primary use case. Um, and so now I'll get into it and show you the code for that. Super, like we've, we've passed the hard part, which was metadata. Uh, it's all gravy now. Um, whoo, metadata. Wow. All right, I think one more. Lazy value. So this one's super simple. OK, so maybe not super simple, but whatever. <laughs> um, it, OK, 
So I, I won't get into the, 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 it took me three months to shake out the implementation details of lazy evaluation. Um, so it's also because I have those, sh those shortcuts or those short outs for if it's not an object, uh, if you pass a callback, uh, a predicate or an iterate T with more than two arguments uh, or more than one argument or zero arguments, I have all these bailouts for it, like almost like a JIT heuristic, right? Uh, and, and that gets a little tricky to track. But the, the, the gist is, is you turn that sequence of, of filter, map, whatever, into a single for loop that executes those callbacks for, for each element uh, at once. And so the, the super secret or the super sauce for this is just this for loop, this while loop, that's it. And all it's doing is saying, hey, this is the first iteration, this is a map. And then the next iteration, that's a filter per element of the collection. So it's flattening it down, similar to that simplified snippet I showed you. Um, and then at the very end, it breaks out and you get your result. And, and that's, that's it, that's, that's lazy evaluation. Um, you can see in the downside to this is, you see that's a loop and those functions are being accessed from a, an array of functions of, of callbacks to apply. Turns out that doesn't work well with inlining. So for small collections, your old chain way without lazy evaluation could actually end up looking faster because uh, there's inlining built in and so all those callbacks melt away, right? Especially for micro optimizations, which people love to do uh, and send me like, hey look, your performance is horrible. I'm adding two numbers together and it's crap. Come on, you're adding two numbers together. Um, it, seriously. So, but anyways, I, 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 I cater to that and say, hey, this optimization only kicks in for large arrays, which in my case is, again, 200 or more. Um, I check to make sure that uh, that shortcut fusion can actually be applied. So for example, if this sequence uh, returns the exact same number of elements as it would uh, without shortcut fusion, I don't apply shortcut fusion. I bail out to the old way. So basically, like if I'm not doing a slice or a take or a rest or an initial or some kind of subsection of the array, I don't even bother with shortcut fusion. Some people like uh, will say, well, what about the intermediate array creation that you could save? Ah, like JavaScript engines don't seem to have a problem with that. It's, I rather leverage the inlining of, of the traditional uh, chaining syntax then. So what you're able to do uh, with this optimization is, it cannot be applied and the code doesn't behave any differently. It melts away, it's just an implementation detail, you never have to worry about it. It kicks in when it kicks in and that's great. So chances are your code, if you have a, an array of more than 200 and you're using the chaining syntax, you'll end up getting this optimization. And if it doesn't kick in, your code's not gonna break. It's gonna perform just like it would before. So I love optimizations where you can remove them like with the weak map or with lazy evaluation and you still have working code. Cool. All right. I think I might be wrapping up, but I'm not. There's a bonus. Okay. So, <laughs> more code. Yes. Uh, hey, check out this. Uh, how many people use compose to, to compose a function? They may call it flow or pipe, something like that, right? Um, turns out, it's just a sequence, just like uh, the, the chaining sequence. So under the hood of my compose function, uh, I create a lazy chained sequence. Uh, and then when you pass in the arguments to the created composed function, I, re I basically rewire the chain sequence to use your, your argument as the root value. And then I get lazy evaluation for free. Super cool. Uh, this syntax here is using lodash fp. So you may notice that, hey, why am I not providing an array to map or filter or take? Um, it's because the arguments are flipped. And it's using the metadata to make sure that the, the actual function is only wrapped once. So great, it's optimizations upon optimizations. Um, and it allows you to then do, um, whoop. So shout out to Lodash FP. Uh, there's the package for it, npmjs.com package Lodash FP. In version four, that's actually gonna be in Lodash, the primary package. So you can just say require Lodash slash FP and you'll get it right there. Uh, it's, it's immutable, it's auto curried functions, uh, it's the argument order is flipped, so it's data last, iterate T first. So if you're into functional programming, this will have you covered, and it's got all the optimizations applied. So you get the classic uh, Lodash performance with all the uh, functional programming uh, goodies. Uh, cool, but um, 
So again, uh, that function there, when you execute, is still only eight iterations, even though you're composing functions and not a lazy sequence. And that's because of awesome source code that I'm about to show you. Awesome source code. So you may be like, why, why do I have all these tabs open? Uh, it's because if the internet went down, I had all my source code open. So I am prepared. Um, wait a minute. I don't have this one. Uh, that's OK. I think I still have internet. Ha ha. So I gave my talk about being prepared and then didn't have the last one. Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> uh, that's all right. I've got the source code for it. So create flow. So this is what it's doing. Super neat trick here. Um, oh, man. I want to get geek out a little bit more into this. Uh, so how do I detect that the, the function that you're passing in is supporting uh, lazy evaluation? Uh, it turns out that functions have a name property. And uh, in environments where they don't have a name property, like IE11, I don't support this optimization, boo, whatever. Uh, other engines have it, uh, so that's great. Um, so what I do is I inspect the function and I say, hey, are you, does it, is it, because remember I create a function that wraps your function? Turns out that name is wrapper. So I look for a function <laughs> with the name wrapper, and if it has the name wrapper, I then see if there's metadata associated with that wrapper. And if there's metadata associated with that wrapper, then I know that I can get to the original function underneath the wrapper. And so then I look for the original function name and then see if it maps to, uh, First, I do a, a, a map of the name and then to the function to say, like, hey, is the original value map from Lodash's map? And I do the strict comparison, and it says, yes, it is. And so then I create, a late, after all of that, I then create a wrapper, which is right here. And I seed it with a dummy value here, and I tell it to chain. Uh, and that value here will never be seen. I, I seed it with an array because that, that tricks my heuristics into thinking, hey, I should use lazy evaluation because I'm operating on an array. Um, cool. Uh, then below here, I start feeding that chain in creating that sequence of the chain, replacing the previous wrapper with the new wrapper, which the, the new wrapper has a reference to the previous one inside its chain. It's keeping track of it. Um, and then at the very bottom, oop, oop. Boop. At the very bottom, if, lo if lazy evaluation is supported, I then just plant the new value in there, and then I execute the chain. That's it. Uh, else, I just do the normal compose function, which is to just do a while loop over your functions, execute them, and pass them the previous value of the executed function. Um, so hey, if the optimization works, great, you get it. If it doesn't, the function doesn't break. It's still, it still gives you what you want, but you can get the optimization out of it. Uh, uh, and that, that is a common use case for functional programming. So after all of that, I think I'm done. So here's my things here. There's lodash.com. There's the repo. I'm on Twitter at at Jay Dalton. Uh, I love to answer any questions. You can always hit me up on GitHubs or Twitters, and I'll answer. I'll help you out there, too. Cool. That's it. Yeah.